Uh, case 14, as usual, I've gone over time, so I've sent my awesome derm residents off to clinic and my awesome derm path fellows, Dr. Michelle Pitch and Dr. Josiah Hansen are now being called out by me, uh, but they're going to stick around and power through the rest. All right, do you guys want to give it a shot? So let's see, what's this one? Uh, 14. Sure. So it looks like we're on the head and neck somewhere. We have this decently oh, yeah. circumscribed purple nodule. Looks like there's some clear cell changes. And then in the other cut, there are some more diluted spaces that had some vascularity to it. So kind of purple nodule in the, in the deeper dermis subcutis with some clear cell change. Immediately you think of um, hydroadenoma, but of course there's a, a differential there. Looking for dunk. Um, as it's loading. <laughs> yeah, I know. My goodness. All right, let's see. Let's go look for ducts. So sometimes the problem here is you see spaces, and the question is, are they real ducts? Are they non-specific, you know, artifactual spaces, or are they vessels trapped up in the the middle of it. I think all of that can be kind of challenging. Like right there, like, I don't know. I I kind of think that might be a vessel with endothelium around the edge. I can't tell because it looks like it's got a, I can't really tell. That could be, I could go either way on that actually. It's got some ductal stuff in it. Though. Yeah, it does. Like, like secretion. So it may be a real, like there, that definitely there's a, a epithelial lining. That I think is a duct right there. But you're right, probably that's a duct, but occasionally you can be tricked by or I can be tricked by vessels that get trapped in the middle. Um, here's a duct. Sometimes the ducts will actually have like a more cuboidal looking or columnar looking lining around them. And oftentimes in hydradenomas, the ducts become very dilated and that's where we get the nodular and cystic hydradenoma. The cyst spaces are actually ducts that are just massively dilated. Like we're starting to see that here and we've got some dried sweat secretion or inspissated sweat secretion in the lumens here of these. And there, look, see, there's like a more cuboidal cell that looks a little different from the rest of the cells. Sometimes you can find that and that can be helpful. And this has got nice clear cell change. Also, so like some true optically clear, like white looking cleared out cytoplasm from glycogen. And then other ones that are more like pale pink, right? Like right there, kind of pink. And sometimes it looks like squamoid. Um, and then uh, you often get a lot of basement membrane material in the background, dense collagen type 4, real sclerotic, hyalinized stuff. And that's a really good clue for hydradenomas and can be seen in a variety of other uh, sweat glands and other adnexal tumors as well. Uh, what other thing? The reason it's here, I think, in the vascular lecture is that sometimes a glomus tumor can look kind of like hydradenoma or spiradenoma, but particularly hydradenoma. <clears throat> because glomus tumors have mon um, monotonous cells that all look the same, one cell type. And in hydradenomas, that's the same scenario. You have one type of cell that all pretty much looks the same. And glomus can sometimes get uh, eosinophilic or pale or even like kind of clear cell change. Um, and when you get those cases, they look more pink like this and not as blue as your kind of classic glomus tumor. And that can be confusing to people. And can uh, and also you, have, you tend to have dilated vascular channels in the background of a hydradenoma. So stains obviously can sort it out. Uh, Hydradenomas will be positive for keratin. And also, like most uh, skin and nexal tumors, they will have expression of P63 or P40. And those markers will be negative in, um, <clears throat> in a glomus tumor. And let's see, up here, I wanted to see, does it connect to the epidermis? I think this is not taught about enough. Um, but hydradenomas, even though they're usually a big one or multiple nodules in the deep dermis or even in the subcutis, they also... Um, uh, relatively often connect to the epidermis and on the surface they can uh, if you have a shave of the top of it it can look very similar to poroma and in fact I kind of have always thought that poroma and hydradenomas are on a spectrum although it seems like not all of them are related because poromas not have a molecular difference uh, from hydradenomas it seems so at least some of them um, may be different molecularly but in any case I think they can get confused with one another and can resemble one another um, especially uh, when you just have the top. So don't be surprised to see the connection of the epidermis. And that right there tells you we're not dealing with the glomus. Glomus is not going to like merge into epithelial cells of the epidermis, right? So that is, um, that's a nice hydradenoma with clear cell change. Oh, and then the last thing is 
um, in the middle here, you could get worried that this is infiltrating, which might make you be concerned for a malignant hydradenoma, or also known as hydradenocarcinoma, uh, which you usually make that diagnosis on the nature of it having frank cytologic malignancy and or infiltrative growth. But the problem is infiltration can be quite hard to assess, especially if you don't have a complete sample. So um, like many other adnexal tumors, you can have this tendency in the center of the lesion to have what looks like complex infiltrative growth. But when you have the whole excision, you can see at the periphery is actually quite well circumscribed overall. Like we don't see the entire periphery, but look over here. See that? It's got like kind of a nice margin around it. And probably that's the same margin that's going to happen down below. Um, I personally don't feel that there's a mandatory need to excise completely every sweat gland tumor. Some people like to do that. I feel like that's a little bit overkill personally, but uh, different, different people have different opinions. Um, so just the main thing is if you get a fragmented area in the middle, um, just recognize that don't like call it malignant outright just because of these um, strands um, uh, that are going back and forth in the background sclerotic basement membrane. Or also if you have a big cystic space, it can rupture and that can create a background of scar and granulation tissue and inflammation in the center of a hydradenoma. And you can get this same kind of infiltrative appearance that's a really kind of a, it's a, a fake, you know, it's happening as a reactive process, but the periphery again is circumscribed. So I think that's important nuanced uh, information about hydradenoma. If in doubt, you can always say, I'm not sure, and you can have them excise it. Um, but um, I feel like I see this kind of uh, this kind of pseudo infiltrative pattern pretty often in these, and it doesn't really worry me. Maybe here's another example over here. All right, hydranoma, also known as acrospiroma.